This broadcast has been made possible by the generous contributions of viewers like you and New Wine Covenant Partners. Welcome to Maximize Life. With Dr. Kyle Adeyemi of New Wine Church London. Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. And our mandate is to challenge you to be all you can be. So get ready to be encouraged, enriched, and empowered. Now here is Dr. Tayo Ariyemi. Okay, tonight we're talking about the un formidable force of agreement, unleashing the formidable force of agreement. Go with me again to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew 18, and let's look at verses 18 to 20. Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Father, we thank you because your word is alive, your word is fresh, your word is strong, your word is real, your word is relevant in every situation. And Lord, we make ourselves available to you this weekend. We sit under your feet to be instructed by you, empowered by you, to be healed, to be encouraged by you. And Lord, I thank you because your mighty power will intervene in every situation presented in this house today. Thank you, Lord, O oh God, because entrance of your word gives light and gives understanding to the simple. As we know the truth, we thank you because the truth will make us free. So open our eyes tonight. Open our eyes that we may see. Open our ears that we may hear. Open our minds that we may perceive and open our hearts that we may receive the truth of your word. Let your kingdom be done. Your, let your kingdom come in our lives and let your will be done. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Help me preach. Touch two or three people and say to them, touch and agree. Remember, we read this passage in the morning and the message translation in verse 19 says, when two of you get together on anything at all on earth, and make a prayer of it, my Father in heaven goes into action. Ladies and gentlemen, we have in this passage a promise that we can make God go into action because we unleash the force of agreement. The Amplified Bible says, again, I tell you, if two of you on earth agree, harmonize together, make a symphony together, about whatever, anything and everything they may ask, it will come to pass and be done for them by my Father in heaven. Isn't it reassuring to know that there is something we can do to make the things we desire in the will of God come to pass? Now that we have at least a foundational understanding about the unbeatable, formidable force of agreement, let's talk about how to unleash it tonight. When you realize how potent the weapon you are carrying is, all of a sudden, it's no longer a nice toy. All of a sudden, it's no longer an accessory to your dressing. It becomes a very dangerous implement in your hand. Who agrees with me? No wonder the Bible says, beat your plowshares into swords and let the weak say, I am strong. When you notice that what you are holding is not just some day-to-day -day e e equipment or day-to-day -day implement, when you notice that what you are wielding is a mighty, powerful, awesome, formidable weapon of war, you can say, I am strong. Somebody say, I am strong. Think about your marriage and say, we are strong. Think about your family and say, we are strong. People of God, you are carrying awesome power. And the devil knows it. The devil knows it. Every time you pick up that weapon, he takes cover. He runs and hides. But he's hoping that you do not know that you are holding something so powerful in your hand. Today, I want to share with you 10 things that you can do to unleash the formidable force of agreement. How many things? 10 things. Are you ready? Number one, contain your enemy. The truth is too many of us have allowed the devil to run amok in our homes uncontrolled. We've allowed the devil to come in. We've given him all the room that he wants. Now, notice, if the devil can't get you to eliminate the middle ground, he will try to usurp the place of God 
in the middle ground. Are you hearing me? How many of you know how Lucifer fell from heaven? He said, I will ascend and place myself above the throne of God. He understands the power on the throne of God. He understands the power on the throne between the cherubim. And he wants to take that place. And listen closely. Listen. Whenever the devil gets involved in any area of your life, his ultimate objective is to replace God in your life. Are you hearing me? He wants you to take your attention off God and place it on him. So if the devil cannot destroy the middle ground, he will plant himself in that middle ground. Are you hearing me today? Now, most of us are too busy fighting each other that we don't notice that the devil has done serious damage in our homes. And until you identify your enemy, you will always be at his mercy. I hate, it to break, I hate to break it to you, but regardless of your thinking, regardless of your convictions, regardless of your deep theology and awesome revelation, your spouse is not your enemy. Hello? Your, your, your husband is not your problem. Your wife is not your headache. I know your spouse is not perfect. I know that sometimes they can be annoying. In fact, I agree that once in a while, the resemblance with the devil is very close. <laughs> Did you hear about the guy who went to church? And this man came walking into the church because he missed his way. He was going to a fancy dress party. He was dressed like the devil. Red suit, horns, uh, 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 pointed tail, a pitchfork in his hand. He enters the service and everybody runs. But this man is, is quite elderly. The man just sits there unconcerned. And uh, the, 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 the guy walks up to him and says, don't you know I'm the devil? He said, yes, I know. He said, aren't you afraid of me? He said, no. He said, why? He said, I've been married to your sister for 48 years. <laughs> so I know sometimes there is a close resemblance. But trust me, your spouse is not the devil incarnate. Your spouse is not the enemy. And part of the devil's tactics in your life is to keep you busy fighting each other so he can continue to wreak havoc unabated, uninhibited. Are you listening to me? And so it's time for you to identify the real enemy, turn from fighting each other, and face the real enemy. Now, the devil knows that he cannot really defeat you because the Bible says greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The Bible says you are more than a conqueror. The Bible says you have overcome the world because this is the victory that overcomes the world, even your faith. So generally, the devil does not try to overcome you in his own strength. But guess what he does? He simply does what he saw God do in Babel. When God saw that the people in Babel were about to achieve something and he knew that nothing would stop them, the Bible says he confounded their language. And the moment their language was changed, guess what happened? They turned on each other until they scattered and they ab abandoned that project. I wonder how many glorious projects, how many God-ordained dreams and visions in homes have been abandoned because our language has been confounded and we have turned against each other. There are couples that have spent months, years even, channeling their energy into hurting each other instead of building something for their marriage and for their family. Are you hearing me today? The devil wants you to turn on one another. And so he knows that you can use each other's strengths to subdue each other and destroy each other. And so without much effort, he keeps you subdued. He has it easy. If you think about the cruel things we do to each other, if you think about the cruel things we say to each other and say about each other, can you imagine that the devil is having a laugh? He has it easy. Stop and realize that your spouse is not your real enemy. And if both of you can simply just turn on the real enemy, you will give him a good run for his money and your victory will be swift. How many of you saw the movie uh, Mr. and Mrs. Smith? Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt. Both of them were secret agents working for two different organizations. And the organization sent both of them on a mission to kill each other. <clears throat> but very quickly, somewhere along the line, the two of them realized that they were not each other's real enemy. 
guess what they did? They both combined forces and they turned against the real enemy and totally overwhelmed the real enemy. Now you can do that. There are too many Mr. and Mrs. Smiths in the house of God and your enemy is using your strengths against each other, using your skills against each other, using your expertise against each other. The things that God put in your life to build each other up, to heal each other, to encourage each other, you are using them to tear each other down and to hurt each other. Contain your enemy. Tell your neighbor for me, contain your enemy. Unleash the power. Number two, control yourselves. Control yourselves. The trouble with most couples is that they have no boundaries. And a relationship with no boundaries is a very dangerous relationship. A relationship with no boundaries is a very insecure relationship. Your physical house is secure because it is built on a solid foundation. Say solid foundation. And it is surrounded by solid walls. Say solid walls. Say solid foundation. Say solid boundaries. So when internal and external pressures arise, your house does not collapse because the foundation is solid and the boundaries are solid. If you lean against the wall of your home, it doesn't fall because it is solid. When the wind blows, when gale force winds, your house will stand because the walls are solid and the foundation is solid. Now, your marriage too needs to be built on the solid foundation of the word. Remember the man who built his house on the sand and the man who built his house on the rock. Both of them came to church. Both of them heard the word. <clears throat> but one of them did it. The other did not do it. You know, it amazes me how many times I deal with couples and there is an issue in their marriage and it's simply because they were not obedient to the word that they heard in church. Are you hearing me? It's one thing to be a hearer of the word. It's another thing to be a doer of the word. Now, you by yourself, Leave your spouse alone for a minute. You by yourself, make up your mind that you will be obedient to the word of God. Because there is blessing in obedience. I said there is blessing in obedience. The Bible says if you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. You make up your mind that as far as you are concerned, as much as it lies with you, you will not allow another person to make you compromise your commitment to obey the word of God. And when you do that, guess what happens? God will honor you. And then as a couple together, come into agreement and say we are going to build this home on the foundation of the word of God. The word of God will be the final arbiter in the decisions that we make. We will be bounded by the word of God. We will be constrained by the word of God. We will limit ourselves to what the word allows us to do. And we will not venture into territory that the word of God forbids us from going into. You ought to stop from time to time. And ask yourselves, what are we building on? So many couples are concerned about what they are building, that they are not paying attention to what they are building on. But also, not only must you have a firm foundation, you must establish some boundaries. Every marriage must have some no-go areas. Settle it between each other. There are some things that must never, what did I say? Never never be said in this marriage. There are some things that must never be done in this marriage. Let me give you a few examples. You come up with your own. Number one, don't desecrate the marriage. Hebrews 13, 4 says marriage should be honored by all. Don't desecrate your marriage with your words. I hate this stupid marriage. You are already giving the devil ammunition to destroy the marriage. Don't desecrate, desecrate the marriage <coughs> with your words. If you go about talking about your marriage everywhere to everybody and all you say about your marriage is a negative marriage, then don't be surprised that the thing collapses eventually. Let me tell you the truth. Hear this now. I have never seen, <laughs> and I've been around for a, not very long, but a few years, and I have never seen a husband or a wife who consistently, consistently, persistently, relentlessly says negative things about their spouse, and that marriage survives. Not one. Not one. And let me tell you the truth. Sometimes when they're saying those things, they're saying it under the guise of receiving counsel. When they're saying those things, they're saying it under the guise of prayer partner. 
If you continually say negative things about your husband, you continually say negative things about your wife to, to other people, eventually that marriage is going to fail. Because there is life in the words you're speaking, there is death in the words you're speaking. And the marriage should be honored, the Bible says. It is a sacred institution. You who are in it are not perfect, but the institution has no problem. Do not desecrate your marriage. Keep it sacred. Your marriage is holy ground. Don't open your mouth and say, I hate this stupid marriage. You have given the devil something to work with. Number two, don't desecrate your marriage with your actions. Adultery is about the greatest self-inflicted assault anyone can commit against their marriage. In that passage in Hebrews 13, 4, it says the marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed undefiled. That's a subject for another day. Number three, don't call each other names. You're stupid, you're an idiot, you're dumb, you're silly, you're selfish. Those are things that should be reserved for unbelievers. You're a child of God. Let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth. Whatever you, dis went, whatever you defile with your mouth will be devalued in your eyes. Are you hearing me? Number four, don't raise your hand to beat your wife. I, I was waiting for all the amens to die down. Oh, Pastor Tyre, does that happen in church? You bet it does. Don't raise your hand to beat your wife. Number five, living is not an option. These are boundaries I'm telling you, telling you about. Living is not an option. Tell your spouse, the day you leave, I'm following you. <laughs> Finally, agree on a small number of people that you can share your problems with. That's a safe place to be. Because sometimes you do need help. Between the two of you, agree on maybe one couple or two couples. And say, when things get tough and you find that I'm not listening to you, you have my permission to go and talk to so and so. And be very selective about who those people are. Be sure that they are mature people. They are people who are full of wisdom. They are people who respect you, who have your best interests at heart, and who will help you. Are you hearing me? So, Pastor Tayo, are you saying this whole boundary thing? Are you saying we must never argue or we must never be upset or we must never disagree? I, I said set boundaries. I didn't say be in prison. That's why your home, even though it has solid walls, it has doors and windows. So you can go out and come in. But notice that doors and windows create controlled traffic. And so, yes, there, there, there will be times that you will be upset. And yet, yeah, give yourself rules and guidelines to how you handle those moments. But don't, don't go crazy because you're upset and you have a point to prove. Your temper, control your temper. Are you hearing me today? Contain your enemy. Say contain your enemy. Control yourselves. Number three, celebrate your differences. This is what this entire convention is all about. Different, say this with me, say different is not wrong, just different. Say it again, different is not wrong, just different. Did you know that it takes a degree of maturity to accommodate other people's preferences and other people's habits and other people's styles and other people's opinions that are different from yours? Immaturity <clears throat> always seeks sameness and similarity. And if you say you love your spouse so much, you want them to be exactly like you, both of you, or at least one of you, is immature. Variety is the spice of life. God does not want to create cookie-cutter Christians. He doesn't want to create conveyor belt couples. See your differences as God-given strengths rather than weaknesses. We heard it this morning. It is not good for the man that the man should be all one. God does not want you to be exactly carbon copies and imitations of each other. You are different. Different is not wrong. Just different. Some people are feelers. Some are thinkers. Some people are introverts. Others are extroverts. Some people are intuitive. Others are logical. Some are structured. Others are flexible. Some are expressive. Others are reflective. Some are spenders. Others are savers. God help us. 
Some are tidy, others are untidy. Sorry, relaxed. <clears throat> some are detailed, others are big picture people. Some rise early, some sleep late. Some are homing pigeons, some are party animals. Some want to keep the TV on, some want to throw the TV out. Some are planners, others are spontaneous. Some are initiators, others are responders. Some want music on all the time, others like music only once in a while. Some like friends and family around all the time, others choose when friends and family come. I'm sure you get the point. Different is not wrong, just different. Beware of your tendency to make your style and opinions and preferences a moral issue. It's not a moral issue, it's a preference issue. Appreciate your spouse's individuality. It takes a miracle to bring two people from two different backgrounds, raised in two different environments, possibly with two different sets of values. Bring them together and make them one. There needs to be adjustment. Somebody say adjustment. I call it the blender principle. In the beginning, when you want to blend stuff and you put all the different components and condiments and ingredients in the blender, when you start the blender, what noise do you hear? It's a very rough noise. It's a coarse noise. Broom, broom, broom. But guess what happens? As the blades of the blender begin to chop off the individuality, you get a smooth drone. Is that not correct? Zzz. And that's the way it is in marriage. There comes a time when we bring our own individuality into the relationship and we bring all the baggage of all our past years and all our past relationships into the marriage. But God begins to smooth us out. God begins to break down our individuality. God begins to bring us to the place where we are dead to self and we love our partner enough to sacrifice for them. Amen. But what I'm saying today is that your differences can actually become your strengths. If one sleeps late and one rises early, then let the one who sleeps late do the things that need to be done late into the night. And let the one who rises early do the things that need to be done early in the morning. If somebody gets ready on time, find a way to use that as an advantage rather than a disadvantage. Amen. Who knows what I'm talking about? There are some now. Now, having said that, I need to point out there are some differences that are destructive and those differences you must deal with. Example, control, irresponsibility, detachment. If a man wakes up in the morning, puts chewing stick in his mouth and goes and sits at the sofa and holds the remote in his hand and that's the way he intends to spend his entire day, week and month, there is something wrong. And then he says, well, pastor says different is not wrong, <laughs> just different. You like to go to work, I like to stay at home. No, 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 no. Call me to come and slap him up the side of his head. Irresponsibility, detachment, rage, criticism, manipulation, self-centeredness, deception, addiction. Violence, those are destructive differences. If every time you have an argument, you smash something in the house. There are women who have a fit of rage that is absolutely scary. And if you are smashing things around the house, one man agrees with me. <laughs> did, I, did I tell you about the man who came in the healing line? Very small statured man. You probably heard me say this before. He came in the healing line, and the pastor said, what do you want me to pray for today? He said, I've got chest pain. And behind him, there was this big, huge woman who says, Pastor, don't mind him. I sat on his chest. <laughs> but there are some women who have a fit of rage. Now, your husband says, honey, we need to deal with your temper. You say, no, different is not wrong, just different. No, 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 no. You are going to destroy yourself, and you are going to destroy the marriage. So how can you identify a destructive difference? Three things. Number one, it compromises love and trust. It compromises love and trust. Number two, it takes away liberty. Your liberty or your spouse's liberty. Number three, it is self-centered. It is me-focused rather than us-focused. If your partner will not deal with a destructive difference, you need to take a stand and you need to make a point and drag her or him to someone in leadership and say, deal with this. Say, contain your enemy, control yourselves, celebrate your differences. 
Number four, consider your expectations. Many people get disappointed in relationships because they idealize relationships. A lot of people come into marriage and six months down the line, they're disappointed because they were in love with the idea of marriage. They have romanticized marriage. People fail in marriage because they come in with high expectations and low responsibilities. If you're coming into a marriage only for what you're going to get out of it, you are going to be disappointed. So manage your expectations. Remember, your knight in shining armor is still only a man. All right? Remember, your gorgeous princess is still only a woman. She is human, and there will be frailties, there will be flaws, there will be failures, and you must be ready to cope with those things. This is the reality. You never truly know a person until you are married to them. And in fact, when you've been married for 10 years, you still truly don't know a person. And so day after day after day, layers are going to be coming off like the onion skin and you're going to be discovering things about each other and some of them will scare you to death. Some of them will scare you. So manage your expectations. I'm not saying take any nonsense. We've just talked about destructive differences. But don't idealize this person. Don't try to make them into what God has not made them. And don't try to make your spouse make up for everything you did not get in your childhood. We hope you have been blessed by today's broadcast. For more details about the dynamic ministry of Dr. Tayo Adeyemi, please contact us using the details on your screen or visit newwine.co.uk. can support this broadcast by becoming a New Wine Covenant partner today. So give us a call using the details on your screen or log on to our website newwine.co.uk to sign up today. In appreciation for your support, you will receive a New Wine Covenant partner kit containing a beautiful executive folder, an enameled lapel badge, and a gift from Dr. Tayo Adeyemi. Just to mention a few, New Wine Church, celebrating 20 years of God's faithfulness.